Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. John White, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD. We talk a lot about cancer treatments, and we have had amazing developments in, in cancer therapies, but we also need to talk about prevention and why we need to spend more time on those preventive strategies. So joining me to discuss the latest data and the latest research is Dr. Lisa Richardson. She's the Director of the Division of Cancer Prevention at the CDC. Dr. Richardson, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, Dr. White. I'm glad to be you here. Know, let's start off with the data. You know, some say that cancer rates are decreasing, mm -hmm. but we have to unpack that data a little more, don't we? Because it's not for all cancers and it's not for all demographics. So fill us in, what, what's the latest? So absolutely, so over the last five years or so, you know, cancer deaths have dropped about uh, 20%, but you're right, it's not equal. It's, go, it's slower for African-Americans, it's slower for some other uh, minority groups, um, but it really is going down for all, but we have a lot more that we need to do to sort of equalize the improvements in cancer outcomes. What's happening with colon cancer? There's been some data to show that it's appearing in younger populations where traditionally we thought of it as a disease of old age. We don't start screening for most people of average risk till their 50s. And then we see these stories of celebrities and others right. who have it diagnosed and die much earlier. What's the latest there? So even under the age of 50, colorectal cancer is fairly um, rare. One of the messages we're trying to get out here at CDC is about on-time screening, screening. So for instance, about less than 30% of 50-year-olds are screened for colorectal cancer. Within 50 to 54, it's about 50%. So really on time. In the younger age groups, um, different medical conditions like um, colitis, mm -hmm. um, Crohn's disease can raise your risk. Um, and family history. One thing that people really need to know is their family history for cancer, especially colorectal cancer, because we will definitely start early. Something you and I have talked about is why don't people have the same perspective on cancer prevention as they do for heart disease or diabetes, right? We all say we're going to go do cardio to protect our mm -hmm. heart. Or if you have a heart attack, then you enroll in cardiac rehab and you, you change everything in your kitchen. The same thing for, for diabetes, yeah. you associate lifestyle with diseases, yet in cancer, we don't really think about, oh, hey, I, I have to do certain things to prevent cancer. Is it because many people feel it's family history, and genetics, or they just don't know? What's the challenge and, and how do we change that mindset? Great question, um, John. That's one of my uh, communication objectives for the division. Why is it that people don't know that being physically active, eating a, you know, a balanced diet, um, not smoking, and there's a lot of smokers still in this country, about 30 million, but what are those messages and why aren't we getting the message out about that? What I find is all the risk factors that you've listed, all the healthy behaviors, work for cancer as well, but I've noticed that when we get when we get with the other conditions or people are talking about uh, chronic disease, it's always at the end of the sentence and cancer. So I think it's one of those things where we have to raise the level of awareness for cancer in the population and that there are things you can do. As a medical oncologist, one of the things I've noticed is that people think cancer is inevitable. So there's really nothing I can do about that. And without understanding, there's tons that you can do about that. It, everything that works for heart disease works for cancer. We're gonna talk about them. But I also yeah. wanna go back to this idea of genetics and inherited yes. um, mutations. We think roughly 15 to 20% mm -hmm. is due to genetics or inherited mutations. Is, is that right? And the rest is lifestyle. I would say a lot of it is, you're right, most of it is lifestyle, but the genetics are very important. Like I was talking about earlier about colon cancer, if it runs in your family, you have to be screened earlier, right? Um, you need to be aware of the risk factors. Um, a lot of us don't even know our family history, so we can start earlier, right? And so one of the things I encourage people to do is talk with their families. And uh, in November around Thanksgiving, you know, the, eight, the Health and Human Services Department has a huge push on knowing your family history, which um, as we talked about earlier, really is the number one um, genetic test for whether you have a, a hereditary cancer. 
you and I did talk about that when we were, you know, wondering whether yeah. people should be getting some of these direct to consumer, these over the counter tests that people spit in a tube yeah. and send in. They don't check for all the mutations. Yeah. I want to talk about those, but it's to your point where you've mentioned, you know what, John, do a detailed good family yeah. history because that's going to trump anything that an over the counter test says. So, can you help, you know, guide listeners when they're thinking about? Uh, some of those over-the-counter tests and, and how they ask a good family history. You have information on your site. So that yes, we do. And the really during, um, the main information we have is in our Bring Your Brave campaign, um, which is for women under 45 um, to train them and teach them questions to ask to know your family history. But really, when we talk about family history, we're talking about your mother and father your brothers and sisters, your aunts and uncles, not more broad than that. Um, cancer is fairly common as we get older. So, you know, a 70 year old, you'd have to take the whole history to see if that relative is, you know, a significant person in your family history. But we just don't take the time to ask our family members. And for whatever reason, cancer is still one of those taboo topics. Um, families, people still keep it to themselves um, when they get cancer, like Chadwick Bozeman did. He didn't tell anyone that he had colon cancer when, you know, when we found out when he passed away. What's the role of the over-the-counter tests? The over-the-counter tests are difficult to really um, get your head around as an oncologist or as any other medical provider. They tell you a lot about, you know, the known genetic abnormalities, but most of the things that cause cancer, we have not found those genes yet. Let's talk about some of those lifestyle changes that people can make. And I want to start with ones they may not you know, be aware of, the role of sleep. And there's been data that shows that shift workers have increased risk of certain cancers. That's not something I knew until recently. We right. really have learned about the power of restorative sleep. So what's your guidance about how much sleep we need and how much we need to focus in terms of lifestyle change on, on the role of sleep as we think about our personal cancer prevention programs. Yeah, so CDC just, um, I think it was last year, we'd have to go back and look it up, uh, put out recommendations for how long people need to sleep um, because it has become one of those public health issues. Um, it's sort of a heroic act to stay up all night, right? Remember in med school, we'd stay up for like days at a time, <laughs> try mm -hmm. to get all the material. But it turns out that it really is sleep, as you said, restores the body. I think it has a link with inflammation. It sort of gets everything back in, um, back in balance again after you've been up all day. But seven, six to seven, maybe eight. I generally sleep about eight to nine hours a night myself. You mentioned about exercise. And much of the data has focused on the need for moderate to vigorous mm -hmm. exercise. Is that right? In terms of elevating... Right. Rate. It's not simply walking around the house or walking around the office or, you know, a lot of folks will say, well, they're active as part of their daily life. Yeah. But the data really points to not just, you know, aerobic, but also mm -hmm. strength training as well. Is that correct? Yeah. So to start out with the, the less than vigorous, you know, physical activity, um, is what is the term that we use here at CDC. Almost any physical activity versus none is good for you. But you're right, walking around my house right now, working at home, I may get, I don't know, what, 600 steps in a day. So you really do have to make an effort to get 600, out. that's <laughs> on the low end. <laughs> that's almost zero, right? So, uh, but anyway, uh, my son is the perfect um, poster child for less than vigorous activity. He went to college, he was, you know, overweight. And with just physically being physically active, walking around campus, actually being intentional about that, he's lost about 50 pounds in the last year and a half. That's and great. so he looks like a completely different person. But to your point, there is a dose response curve with physical activity. So the more physically active you are, the more benefit you get in cancer uh, prevention, yes. Let's talk about the concept of food as medicine. And yes. some people like to use the term superfoods. We know there is some association with certain cancers mm -hmm. and certain foods. That's probably the biggest struggle mm -hmm. for people. What does your office recommend in, in terms of how we look at diet, in terms of what we consume on a daily basis? 
Well, the usual recommendations, I think what does people, people say, it's what your grandmother told you. Lots of fruits and vegetables, um, things that are what, um, orange and red, the, the mo you know, more vitamins, um, not a lot of red meat because there's, you know, carcinogens in that, um, mainly less fat in your diet, and also fiber to keep your colon moving, right, so that you're not, and act, physical activity, obviously, to get off, to get off of our, um, tushes and get out there and do something other than sit in front of our computer. But yeah, the um, recommendation is um, just to eat a balanced diet and vitamins are not necessary if you do that. And coffee's okay. That's what I read. It, yes. Coffee, coffee is definitely okay. I've had my coffee already. Now I'm on the green tea. Okay. What about the role of stress? People say it's the role of cortisol. It's, you know, the impact of, of hormones, particularly as it relates to cancers that are hormone related, such as mm -hmm. breast cancer and prostate cancer. Do we have good data about the role of stress and, and therefore do we need to practice mindfulness and, and meditation? What, what are your thoughts on that? So st stress impacts every one of our, you know, health, all the healthy things that we do. Stress is not good for any of us. So you're right. Mindfulness is really one of the things that um, is um, in vogue right now, should have probably always been in vogue, but it really just to get your heart rate down, to get yourself in another place mentally and physically, um, because stress can impact almost every single thing in your life and your health. Mm -hmm. and, and what about screening? Th there seems to be a lot of confusion about screening at times, especially as it relates to mammography, as it relates to colorectal screening, we use terms that patients don't understand. So where can they go for good guidance? It's always good to talk to their physician, obviously. But right. many people are you know, going to urgent cares and others uh, to, right. to get care. And they need to be informed as well about the appropriate screening recommendations. So right. what's your counsel on that? So if you're looking for information that's written well and simply, you know, CDC's website, cdc.gov slash cancer is a very good place to go. But to answer your question about confusion, when I'm talking to patients about um, screening, I usually go to the place where we can agree on what, who needs to be screened. For women, it's 50 to start. For colon cancer, it's 50 to start. Then, and the other tests also have their ages. Then when you're speaking with someone, you sort of break down what their personal risk is and what their personal risk is as far as their mental, um, I can't think, the, you know, people are very stressed out about screening. I'm gonna get cancer. So then to sort of see is what would do, what do we call it, the well patient kind of um, situation where we, we really know that you're okay, but sometimes, people's decisions have to be based on their comfort level for not getting something versus getting something. So it requires a conversation with the patient about what their personal risk is and what their values are in their health care. Something our listeners may not be aware of is the role of vaccination. Here we're talking about cancer and there's a role yeah. for vaccines, specifically HPV and Hep B, yes. correct? And, and CDC has put out guidance in terms of recommendations for vaccination in, in both of those categories. Is that correct? Absolutely. It's the ACIP um, recommendations. They meet twice a year. And you're absolutely correct. The um, initial message on HPV was that it was a, uh, is a sexually transmitted disease where we maybe got into some difficulty with those messages. But now we've switched it to it's a cancer vaccine. And it really is a cancer vaccine. Um, almost 100% effective against cervical cancer, and the data are coming out now around the other HPV-related cancers that it is helpful in those as well. What does the future of cancer prevention look like? Well, I tell you, I think the future, for me, the future of cancer prevention looks like um, how can we more deliberately and clearly message what is, what is going to prevent cancer? I think within the realm of medications, there's you know, more and more research on that side. And um, genomics, genomics are quite powerful with the family history to try to figure out how to, how to help people live healthier. Um, and in the long run, I see the main thing in cancer control is the number of cancer survivors that we have. We really have to double down on healthy behavior messages for that population, because the thing that got you the cancer in the first place is the thing that's gonna get it, you know, the cancer back or a new cancer 
if we can't, you know, help people change their behaviors. And to your point of, of making it more personalized. So yes. looking at your personal risk based on family history, yes. based on lifestyle, based on weight uh, and, and other factors as well. Well, Dr. Richardson, I want to thank you for taking time today to kind of help dispel some of those myths that people have about cancer, specifically as it mm -hmm. relates to prevention. And the reality is, as you point out, most cancers are lifestyle uh, mm -hmm. related and, and we can make those changes. Not that they're easy, nope. but they're important to do and to make changes over time to take control of one's risk. So thank you. Thank you.